It is, once again, the spooky season, which we celebrate here on Let's Talk Religion by talking about all kinds of uh, creatures and, and spooky things in general. And, of course, we're going to do that this year as well. Previously, uh, in this, the Shocktober series of videos, we've talked about all kinds of uh, creatures from jinn in Middle Eastern folklore to uh, the good old vampire last year. But sometimes you just want to cozy up with a classic old-fashioned ghost. Perhaps the most common and famous of all the things that go bump in the night. Ghosts come in many different shapes and sizes and are, of course, shaped by the culture and context in which they appear. Ghost hunting has become a very popular genre here on YouTube and elsewhere recently, showing that there is still a huge interest around specters and spirits. But stories about ghosts go back far into history, and we find examples of them already in antiquity. But with that said, have ghosts remained consistent throughout all of that history and across different cultures? What are ghosts, really? How can we define them and understand them? And can we trace a, a development of, of ghosts and our understanding of ghosts throughout history? That is precisely what we're going to be exploring in this episode. Because we all love the spooky season here on Religion Tube, as it is sometimes uh, known, we're doing a sort of big collab for this whole month, uh, where we're all going to be posting uh, different uh, spooky content, especially me, uh, my colleague Dr. Justin Sledge on Esoterica, and Dr. Angela Puka on Angela's Symposium. So this is a whole uh, festival this month, which we might call something like Religion Spook or spooky too, perhaps, uh, regardless of the name. Maybe you, sh you can leave uh, comments on which name you prefer, or maybe a, a better name than those two. Uh, but for those interested in the spooky and the macabre and all these uh, darker topics, uh, go check out the videos that will be posted on their channels as well, Esoterica and, and uh, Angela Symposium, uh, as well as more videos coming uh, on this channel this month for the spooky season. I am very much looking forward to this. Everyone knows what a ghost is, right? I think we all get at least a similar image in our minds when we think about the word ghost, but things aren't necessarily that simple. The word ghost can have many different meanings and has been used in different ways across history. The roots of the word come from words like ghast in Old English, as well as other etymological cousins stretching back far into history. Earlier, the word and its cognates were used to denote the life force behind a thing, equivalent to things like the Greek pneuma and the Latin spiritus, or spirit. In many ways, this was kind of equivalent to the concept of the soul, that which, is that which animates and gives life to things. We can still see this older use of the word in the Holy Ghost of the Christian Trinity, sometimes also referred to as the Holy Spirit, right? so we can see that spirit and ghost is kind of synonymous in this way. But eventually, ghost came to be used to denote something different, something more frightening and peculiar. It wasn't just a spirit in the wider sense, but the spirit of someone diseased that had returned to this world. This can be seen, for example, in the works of Shakespeare in the 16th and 17th century, such as in Hamlet, where a ghost plays an important part of the plot. Today, perhaps the most standard understanding of ghosts is that it is the spirit of a diseased person who has somehow returned to or lingered in the world of the living, and can be seen or in some way experienced by the people who still are alive. These can then also have certain recurring characteristics, such as being translucent and often pale. Often, people who experience a ghost will be maybe family members or friends of the diseased person that is haunting them, or the ghost in question has maybe been killed in an unjust way and is seeking vengeance, thus being a malevolent and vengeful ghost. It is this wider definition of ghost that we will be using in this episode. 
Um, it is indeed a, a important and good question to consider whether we can actually use the word ghost to refer to all these different beings and stories across the world. Is the Japanese yurei the same as the European ghost, for example? Right? These are questions that um, are worth asking ourselves. But, but I think that the experience of ghosts, as we understand them, are so universal and can be found across history and in so many different parts of the world that we can justifiably talk about ghosts in this universal way, at least since we have defined it in this broader sense. And with this in mind, while the word ghost being used in the particular way that we know it today might not be that old, the reports, stories, and claimed experiences of these beings or spirits can be found going back thousands of years, and in a surprisingly wide array of geographical and cultural areas otherwise unconnected. All the way back in ancient Mesopotamia, there is the concept of the Gidim, or the Etimu, depending on if you're speaking Sumerian or Akkadian, as spirits of the dead who dwell in the netherworld called Irkala, equivalent to the Hades in Hellenic religion. These spirits of the dead could also interact with the world of the living in different ways. It was expected of the family of the deceased to keep making offerings to them so as to make their stay in the underworld more bearable. But if they failed to do so, the ghost of the deceased could cause various troubles and illnesses. So just like in many other cultures, as we will see, like in China, for example, um, revering or respecting the ancestors is very important. To give offerings uh, in different ways to the dead could be an important factor in making sure that the afterlife of that person is a pleasant one. If you fail to do so, then there could be repercussions. Right? The ghost could come back and haunt you in different ways, could cause you misfortune, could cause you trouble. This is a, a common theme in many ancient and non-ancient cultures. The ancient Egyptians famously had a lot to say about death and what happens to us after we leave this life. The Egyptians may indeed have been some of the earliest to conceive of the soul as we understand it, but their idea of soul was quite different. Indeed, they believed that we have several different souls, or at least parts of the soul, perhaps, which survive after we die. There was the ka, or vital essence, which stayed in the tomb after death and could be sustained through things like food and drink that was often left in the tomb. There was also the ba, which is more so the personality of the person. The ba was imagined as taking the form of a bird with a human head and could fly out of the tomb to the world of, of the afterlife and come back. There was also the Ach, an immortal transformed self. Right, so this Ach comes to be after uh, the person has traversed, uh, or the soul has traversed all these uh, lands of the afterlife, right? When, the, when it has reached this final stage, that is when the Ach comes to be. So the Ach is not present right now as I am alive. I don't have an Ach, but that is a, an aspect of the soul that sort of um, develops after this journey through the underworld. The ideas of the Egyptian soul and afterlife are very complex, and in some instances the Ba and Ka are reunited to animate the Ach, which then traverses the realms of the underworld, or, or enters into the field of reeds. Famously, the soul of the diseased has to go through various trials and travel through dangerous realms after death, which is why the Egyptians left things like boats and weapons in their graves. This is also the origin of famous texts like the Book of the Dead, or more properly known as the Book of Coming Forth by Day, which was essentially a set of instructions, prayers, and spells meant to help the diseased person travel through the underworld. At some point, the soul comes to a kind of court ruled over by the god Anubis, where their heart would be weighed against the feather of ma'at, which means order or justice, on a scale. If their heart was heavier than the feather, it would be thrown to the terrifying Amit monster, which would eat it, condemning the soul to oblivion. But if the heart was lighter or equally light to the feather, the soul was allowed to enter into the paradisial field of reeds. Anyway, all this to say that the Egyptians also believed that the soul, particularly the Ach, could also return to the world of the living as a ghost. 
Perhaps, as we said, the family hadn't given them a proper burial, so they had to come back to right the wrong committed against them. Classic ghost stuff. And we actually have some famous ghost stories from ancient Egypt. One of them is called Khunsemhab and the Ghost. It's a story either from the New or Middle Kingdom, but tells the tale of a priest of Amun called Khunsemhab, who has an encounter with a ghost. The beginning of the story is sadly lost, but judging from what happens after, it seems that he had some kind of uh, ghostly experience when he was in the necropolis of Thebes, where he suddenly encounters the ghost or spirit of someone who has been long deceased. When the story picks up, he's returning home, and once there, he summons the spirit again to inquire further about who he is and what he wants. Turns out, he's the ghost of a man called Nebusemech, who is grieved by the fact that his tomb has deteriorated. The ground beneath it has collapsed, destroying it in the process. Now, as we know about ancient Egyptian beliefs about the dead, the state of the tomb and the offerings given are very important. And since Nebusemech's tomb has been destroyed, no one can find it anymore and therefore they can't give any offerings. His spirit has thus become a restless ghost. The priest then promises that he will build a new tomb for Nebusemech, but the latter is skeptical. However, the priest sends his servants to find the ruined tomb and announces that he is going to build a new one. Sadly, just as with the opening, the ending of the story is also lost. But again, judging from the way the story seems to be going, we have to assume that Khonsemhab follows through on his promise. This is what most people assume, at least. This is perhaps not that spooky of a ghost story, but it does tell us a lot about the way that the Egyptians view the afterlife and the way that spirits or ghosts function within that wider worldview. There are also ghost encounters in the great epics of Homer. In one of the most famous and powerful sections from the Odyssey, Odysseus travels to Hades, the underworld, where he meets and converses with the ghosts or spirits of various people, from his mother in a very touching section, to his old allies in the Trojan War, like Achilles, Agamemnon, etc. Certainly, these are ghosts that he is encountering in some way, but at the same time, it is Odysseus himself who has traveled to the underworld to meet them, and not the dead who have returned to the world of the living. So, can they then be considered ghosts based on the definition that we've been using today? It's up to you to decide. But it is in the Hellenic, and especially the later Roman world, that we find some of the earliest examples of ghosts and ghost stories as we more commonly know them today. Ghosts were thought to roam the cemeteries and could come back to the world of the living to seek vengeance. The Roman philosopher and writer Apuleius wrote, There is also another species of demons, according to a second signification, and this is the human soul, after it has performed its duties in the present life and quitted the body. I find that this is called in the ancient Latin language by the name of the lemur. One of the best examples of the ghost as it was understood in antiquity comes from an actual ghost story that seems to have been quite popular. The most famous version of this story was told by Pliny the Younger and is incredibly fascinating. Despite being 2,000 years old, this story feels strikingly modern in almost every way. The way the ghost is described, the mystery that unravels, and the solution and conclusion could all be taken straight from a modern ghost tale or a scary movie. It roughly goes like this. In Athens, there was a large house that was thought to be haunted. The previous residents and neighbors claimed that strange noises could be heard in the house at night particularly the sound of rattling chains which would come closer and closer. The rumors also said that eventually, if one dared to stay in the same room, a frightening ghostly apparition of an old man would appear. Now, a few years later, the house had been abandoned and had received a legendary status as a place haunted by ghosts. Eventually, a Stoic philosopher called Athenodorus comes to the city, and he sees that the house in question is selling at a very low price. This seems suspicious to him, given how large and beautiful of a house it is, so he inquires about it and he does find out about its ghostly haunted story. 
Not dissuaded by this though, he still buys the house and prepares to stay his first night sitting at a desk with a lamp dedicating all his attention to his writing. Pliny tells the rest of the story like this. The first part of the night passed with usual silence. Then began the clanking of iron fetters. However, he neither lifted up his eyes nor laid down his pen, but closed his ears by concentrating his attention. The noise increased and advanced nearer till it seemed at the door and at last in the chamber. He looked round and saw the apparition exactly as it had been described to him. It stood before him, beckoning with the finger. Athenodorus made a sign with his hand that it should wait a little, and bent again to his writing. But the ghost rattling its chains over his head as he wrote, he looked round and saw it beckoning as before. Upon this, he immediately took up his lamp and followed it. The ghost slowly stalked along as if encumbered with its chains, and having turned into the courtyard of the house, suddenly vanished. Athenodorus, being thus deserted, marked the spot with a handful of grass and leaves. The next day, he went to the magistrates and advised them to order that the spot be dug up. There, they found bones commingled and intertwined with chains, for the body had mouldered away by long lying in the ground, leaving them bare and corroded by the fetters. The bones were collected and buried at the public expense, and after the ghost was thus duly laid, the house was haunted no more. A spooky example of an ancient ghost story that has many of the tropes that we find in similar ghost stories and scary movies today. The Middle East also has its fair share of spooky creatures and monsters that roam the deserts and oases. Most famously are of course the Jinn and its subcategories like the Efrit and the Ghul or Ghul. These are mysterious creatures that can be both good and bad and are commonly found in dark, abandoned places like cemeteries and old abandoned ruins. These can't really be called ghosts though because they're not these spirits of diseased human beings, rather being separate beings altogether. In fact, in the Islamic religion and culture, there is very little in terms of ghosts. The idea that those who have died can come back to this world isn't really something that is widely believed in, since it is believed that the dead go to another realm altogether, either the Barsakh or to paradise and hell, and they stay there. Now that isn't to say that we don't find ghosts at all in this culture, but it is strikingly absent, especially given how common these ideas seem in other parts of the world. Because indeed, we can travel all the way over to East Asia, in places like China and Japan, and find a very vibrant and long-lived ghost culture. In China, there has traditionally been a very strong culture of ancestor veneration and worship. It is believed that the spirits of the dead live on somehow, that the bodily soul stays behind in this world, whereas the mental soul ascends to heaven. And on certain festivals and celebrations during the year, offerings will be made to the ancestors to keep them at peace. Within Taoism, it is believed that the shamans can communicate with the dead in different ways, and the veil between the world of the living and the dead is generally a bit thinner, you could say. This becomes perhaps especially apparent in one of the most popular festivals in East Asian culture, the Hungry Ghost Festival. This takes place on the 15th day of the 7th lunar month of the year, when it is believed that the gates of the underworld are opened and the ghosts return to this world to seek food and entertainment. There is a kind of sad aspect to this festival, because it is primarily ghosts who don't have any families, whose families didn't pay proper tribute to them after they died, or spirits that have done evil while they are alive that roam the world during this festival. These hungry ghosts are perpetually hungry, thirsty, and restless, doomed to wander and never be able to satiate their hunger. Quote, hungry ghosts were the spirits of those who had performed evil deeds in life and were condemned to wander as ghosts instead of moving on to a new life or to heaven. During this festival, families will light incense outside their houses, offer food to the wandering ghosts, again often outside their houses so that the ghosts don't intrude inside the house, and Buddhist and Taoist officials will hold ceremonies to help the spirits and relieve their suffering. They can uh, read uh, sutras and, and perform different rituals in this way. 
The most visually famous aspect of this festival is also the lighting of lotus-shaped lanterns that are set afloat in the water. It is believed and hoped that the light from these lanterns will guide the lost souls to the afterlife. With a culture that is so infused with ancestors, ghosts, and spirits, there is of course a whole host of different ghost stories as well. Many of these are gathered in the classic collection called Strange Tales from a Chinese Studio, collected by a guy called Pu Songling during the Qing Dynasty. Many of these stories have become very popular and famous. In one, the scholar Zhu on a dare sneaks into a local temple at night and steals the idol of a judge Lu, which he returns home with. He then jokingly invites the dead judge to come drink with him. To his shock, the ghost of the judge actually shows up, but the story isn't as frightening as we might expect from a ghost story. The two actually become good friends, and the ghost helps Zhu with several things, albeit in slightly gruesome ways. Zhu wakes up one night to find the judge on top of him, opening up his chest. The judge explains that his bad writing is due to his weak heart, so he's replacing it with a new heart, so that he can become a better scholar, a better writer. Later on, Zhu also asks the judge to do something about his wife's looks, who he doesn't think is very beautiful, he wants her to become more beautiful. However, the spirit goes ahead and straight replaces her whole head with another person. A strange but very intriguing story from the Chinese tradition of ghost stories. Japan also probably has some of the most famous ghost stories in the world. With the popularity of Japanese horror films and video games in the 21st century, the rest of the world has been exposed to their fascinating and unique ghost culture. In Japan, there are creatures or beings known as yokai. These are spirits or creatures that give character to basically anything that goes bump in the night that we can't explain. There are yokai representing various different things and concepts, somewhat similar to the kami of the Shinto religion. These yokai are often depicted as animal-like and can be quite colorful and interesting. Sometimes they are friendly and cute, at other times they are very frightening. But we can't really call them ghosts, at least not with the definition that we have been using today. For that, we instead have to look at what is known in Japanese as a yurei, often simply translated as a ghost. Yurei are the spirits of deceased human beings, usually ones that, for whatever reason, are unable to move on fully to the afterlife. Perhaps because they have been wronged in some way, or their death was especially gruesome or unfair. In Japanese yurei stories, these ghosts will often come back and haunt the person who did them wrong. And as in other cultures, there is often a moral message behind many of these stories. The yurei, while of course somewhat diverse, also has a very common classic appearance. Often, first of all, usually being a woman, usually with long black hair and a white dress, and usually also, at least in the older depictions, without any feet. These tropes can be clearly seen in many of the most famous examples of Japanese horror movies in the last couple of decades, such as in Ring or the Juon series. Telling these ghost stories, called kaidan, has been a major part of Japanese culture, especially since the Edo period. There was even a game developed during this period dedicated to telling ghost stories, called Hyakumonogatari Kaidankai, where a hundred candles would be lit at night and the people present would take turns telling ghost stories, blowing out a candle after each story, thus making the room increasingly darker with each candle. And when the last candle was uh, was extinguished, it was believed that something or someone would be hiding in the darkness. So it was a very sort of tense atmosphere as, as they were telling these stories. We will be dedicating a full episode to the Japanese ghost stories and culture and the yurei later on this month, so stay tuned for that. Occasions like the Hungry Ghost Festival, of course, also reminds us of other similar practices around the world, such as All Souls Day. You can watch my episode on the history of Halloween for more information about that. And especially the so-called Días de los Muertos, the Day of the Dead, celebrated primarily in Mexico and the Spanish-speaking Americas. This festival seems to be a kind of combination of the All Saints and All Souls Day festivals in Europe and all Aztec practices. 
During these days, it is believed that the spirits of the dead return to this world and families do their best to remember and honor them in different ways, primarily through a kind of altar called an ofrenda, where things like food and drink will be offered. The fact that family members make an effort to actively remember the dead is what keeps them at peace in the afterlife, so to say. In Europe, ghosts continue to be popular during the Renaissance and Enlightenment periods, arguably becoming even more prominent uh, in this period, especially with the emergence of what's known as Gothicism and the Gothic literature and aesthetic, which I believe that Justin has just covered in, a, in an episode on his channel, so definitely go check that out. This might be surprising to some, given that we perhaps associate these kinds of beliefs and ideas with superstition that belongs to a less enlightened age like the Middle Ages, where traditional religious beliefs were more influential. But how did actually Christianity, religion, and the church actually tackle the question of ghosts? Did it believe in them? What were they, and what was the stance of the church to these questions? Well, just like with our discussion of vampires and their origin, it could vary. The great medieval Catholic theologian and philosopher Thomas Aquinas definitely believed in ghosts, saying in his masterpiece the Summa Theologica that, quote, According to the disposition of divine providence, separated souls sometimes come forth from their abode and appear to men. It is also credible that this may occur sometimes to the damned, and that for man's instruction and intimidation they be permitted to appear to the living. He even claimed to have experienced ghostly visits himself, one time from his dead sister who told him that she was in purgatory and needed him to pray for her. After he had done so for a while, she appeared to him again in Rome and told him that she was now in heaven. At another time, Thomas was visited by a friend and fellow Dominican, Brother Romanus, who told him that he had died recently, which Thomas apparently didn't know yet at that time. But others have greatly disagreed, however. The great reformer Martin Luther did not believe that ghosts were real. Instead, he argued that they are demons that take the form of deceased people to trick us. He says, Therefore we should know that all those ghosts and apparitions which are seen or heard, especially with rumbling and rattling, are not the souls of men, but surely devils, who are playing either at deceiving the people with false claims and lies, or at frightening and afflicting them in vain. So from a religious standpoint, the answers have been many and varied. And some, outside of the religious sphere, even rejected the existence of ghosts and demons altogether, such as the Enlightenment philosopher Baruch Spinoza, who said, I have never read a trustworthy author who clearly showed that there are such things. Regardless, it is during the Enlightenment period that we see a flourishing of ghost accounts and stories in Europe, in places like Great Britain. There was the so-called drummer of Tedworth in the 17th century, where the magistrate John Mompesson had arrested a drummer and confiscated his instrument, after which he and his family were plagued by loud drumming noises and rapping in their house. In the early 18th century, the family of John Wesley in Lincolnshire also experienced strange noises, knockings, and even saw objects flying in the air. These kinds of hauntings, where no actual visual apparition was seen, but were limited to noises and other disturbances, give birth to a new kind of ghost, often known as a poltergeist, which literally means something like a noisy ghost in German. But it is in the 19th century that some of the most recognizable aspects of modern ghosts and ghost encounters are born. This is not only through very important literary works such as Charles Dickens's A Christmas Carol, published in 1843, and being perhaps the most famous ghost story in history, but also primarily through the movement known as Spiritualism. Spiritualism was a belief system that emerged as part of the wider world of occultism and quote-unquote Western esotericism that was growing in popularity in the 1800s. At the core of this movement was the idea and belief that our individual awareness and person survives after death as a spirit, and that the spirits of the dead could be directly communicated with in different ways. Many point to the 18th century Swedish mystic, scientist, and theologian Emanuel Swedenborg as an important early influence on spiritualism. Being originally an aristocrat, inventor, and scientist, Swedenborg began having mystical visions and experiences later in life. 
visions of the afterlife, heaven and hell, and the spirits of the dead. Swedenborg wrote about these experiences and ideas in many writings, and he became a very popular and influential figure in these subsequent forms of esotericism in Europe and America, not to mention the unique form of Christianity that he founded. And the so-called spiritualism of the 19th century seems to be a part of his wider legacy. The essential characteristics of spiritualism, as we have said, is the idea that the spirits of the dead can be communicated with through different means. Thus, we see individuals claiming to be so-called mediums, someone with a special ability to perceive and communicate with spirits, often through rituals like the famous seance. There are many famous examples of mediums at this time, such as the often cited Fox sisters. After experiencing strange occurrences and noises in their home, it was discovered that the youngest sister, Kate, could directly communicate with the spirit. It would answer questions and requests, and they developed a technique where the spirit would be able to communicate directly by making tapping noises at appropriate letters of the alphabet as it was recited aloud. So the Fox sisters would recite the alphabet, let's say the A, B, C, D, etc., and then the ghost would tap, or make a tapping noise at a particular letter, right? And then they would start again, and the, the tapping would stop at another letter, and eventually they would have a full word or a phrase or, or sentence, right? So this is the way that uh, they believe that this ghost uh, would be able to communicate with them. Uh, the Fox sisters became very famous. They would hold public seances around the country uh, in America, uh, and, and a lot of people came to see these, these spectacles. Eventually, however, it was revealed in different ways that the whole thing had been a hoax. The Fox sisters had been producing these knocking and tapping sounds by popping the joints in their feet, basically. But uh, the, the popularity of these uh, seances and, and spiritualism also meant that new mediums and similar uh, people popped up all around America and, and Europe. Uh, people who would hold public seances, uh, gather people who would come to see them, uh, where they would claim to be able to communicate with dead relatives, etc. This became a huge boom in the late 19th and, and early 20th century. Many of these became equally famous, or even more so, than the Fox sisters, such as the Davenport brothers, who put on elaborate shows including spirit boxes, musical instruments, and a lot more. But a lot of people were also skeptical of these mediums and their activities. One of the more prominent of these skeptics was the famous illusionist and escape artist Harry Houdini, who would constantly and actively criticize and expose these spiritualists as frauds. And indeed, as the spiritualist movement continued to grow into the 20th century, the mediums came under increasing fire from a lot of critics. There were even research teams established with the express purpose of investigating these claims of supernatural powers and contact, and more and more of the mediums became exposed as hoaxes in different ways. Thus, by the mid-20th century, spiritualism had become significantly less popular, but its ideas and the popularity of ghosts had by no means disappeared. Indeed, as we can see, the spiritualist movement, even though it became a lot less popular, has hugely influenced the way that we talk about ghosts and hauntings today. Right? If you watch uh, ghost hunting shows on, on TV or on YouTube, it's, it's, it's the same thing. Right? The way that we uh, use seances to contact ghosts, uh, things like Ouija boards and other things, it all comes directly from the spiritualist movement. Right? Ectoplasms, uh, talking about ghosts as leftover energy, uh, the whole lingo around the topic, it all owes a huge amount to the spiritualist movement, even though in itself it sort of, it didn't, it never died out obviously, but it became significantly less popular by the mid 20th century. Uh, it, it survives in many different ways to this day uh, through these different uh, ghost hunting equipments and, 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 and shows and, and just ways of conceptualizing this topic. But as we have seen, this is just one development in a much larger and longer story about ghosts that stretches throughout all of history, and which continues to develop and change even today.
The 20th century was of course one where new mediums such as film had an enormous impact on the world, coupled with new revolutionary ways of communicating with each other around the world, sharing stories about spooky and unexplained encounters. We see very influential works of literature, like Shirley Jackson's The Haunting of Hill House, which depicts a group of individuals investigating a by now classic haunted house. Some of the most famous hauntings of the last century are those that were depicted in movies and other forms of media, such as the Amityville Horror, when the Lutz family claimed to have experienced such intense supernatural activity in their house that they left suddenly one night after only living there for 28 days. There is also the famous case of the Enfield poltergeist in England in the late 1970s, when a family was terrorized by a ghost for years. The family claimed that furniture was moved around on its own, objects being thrown across the room, and that the daughters even levitated, and are photographs that claim to capture this levitation happening. This famous haunting eventually became the basis for the second Conjuring movie in 2016. As technology and culture changes, so do, of course, our ghosts. And we see this clearly in the ghostly entertainment that we consume and create. With the advent of the internet, we see ghosts invading this space too, as depicted, for example, in the Japanese horror film Cairo, or Pulse, from 2001, where ghosts terrorize people and visit the living through the internet. This is probably one of the most unsettling films that I have ever seen, and it's highly recommended for anyone who can take the, the scares and that's interested in these kinds of topics. Later still, ghosts became part of social media, with movie franchises like Unfriended, and we've seen the emergence of creepypasta culture, where scary stories are told on places like Reddit and 4chan, leading to all new urban legends about ghosts and monsters, like for example Slenderman. In the last few years, the genre of ghost hunting has become incredibly popular on YouTube, launching the careers of people like um, Sam and Colby, uh, BuzzFeed Unsolved, and Watcher with their Ghost Files series. Not to mention the many TV series on actual network television, also um, centered around ghost hunting in different ways, like, like Ghost Adventures. Uh, does anyone remember Ghost Asylum and Ghost Brothers? Uh, those were incredibly goofy. Anyway, I think it's safe to say that ghosts aren't going anywhere anytime soon. They have been part of the collective human experience for basically as long as we've had recorded history, regardless if they are quote-unquote real or not, and despite the fact that the way we understand and talk about them have changed in different ways. There is no denying that there are few things as cozy as sitting down to listen to a good ghost story, and this is probably why it has survived for this long. It's been an essential part of the stories and tales that we tell ourselves and each other as people, stories that help us connect with each other, but also which opens up conversations and contemplations about who we are, what matters to us, and perhaps most profoundly, what happens after we die. While ghost stories are often scary, they also bring a strange sense of comfort to a lot of people. Because even though the sudden sight of a ghostly figure would frighten us to our core, it simultaneously gives us some hope that there is something more waiting for us beyond the veil of death. Spooky season has officially started and I'm very excited to be doing this wider project, SpookyTube, ReligionTube, uh, along with my friends Dr. Justin Sledge at Esoterica and Dr. Angela Puka on Angela's Symposium. We will all be releasing different uh, spooky uh, videos, spooky content this month, so go subscribe to their channels if you haven't, and look forward to content on, on all of these channels uh, about topics like this. I hope you found uh, this uh, exploration of ghosts a good entry point to the, to the spooky season and to sp spooky tube uh, this year. Uh, as always, I, I just love doing these videos. It, it, it helps me get into the, the, the fall mood, uh, the October mood, which I, I love so much, and I'm looking forward to uh, exploring more topics uh, in the coming weeks until we reach Halloween at the end of October. Until then, I'll see you next time.